I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. Since I was 10, I wanted to be Prime Minister. Hannah Ferguson, welcome to Straight Talk. Thanks for having me. You are the founder of Cheek Media, and Cheek Media in turn owns the podcast Big Small Talk. What's your thesis behind Big Small Talk? I think the difference with what I do is that I'm critical of the short-form journalism that has led us down this path of not being able to talk to each other respectfully anymore. I think there's no room for healthy debate. There's no public intellectuals anymore. I'm trying to engage a younger audience with those more respectful, secure ideas of how do you consume news and how do you check your media literacy. You're not trying to get them to agree with you. No. You want them to not change the view they have, but change the way they think about it. Exactly. And discuss it. You said earlier on about becoming Prime Minister. Do you really mean it? Seriously? Yeah, totally. It's okay. so funny. It's so funny that you think that, like, come on, why? No, no, no. no. I'll tell you why. Because I was once asked, would I form another party? And, uh... Hannah Ferguson, welcome to Straight Talk. Thanks for having me. Well, first of all, I've got to congratulate you on um, your success. Your podcast success is uh, killing at, like, number three or something like that. I don't know, somewhere with two, three, four in that territory. Yeah, we'll say two. Let's go for the highest we can well, let's get. Let's go for one. Fuck that. Yeah, exactly. Go for one. Got to knock off Joe Rogan, yeah. but we're close. No, but, but, it's, but it's very good. And um, so you're, the, you're, you are the founder, I guess maybe co-founder of Cheek Media. Yes. You got a partner. Yes. Partner, well, uh, right partner. now I'm the founder and CEO of Cheek. Right. Yeah. And, and Cheek Media in, in turn owns the podcast Big Small Talk. Is is just one po- one podcast? Yeah, it's currently one podcast. Oh, currently, currently, yes, currently being plans, the keyword. Plans, plans. <laughs> plans. We'll talk about the plans, perhaps. Um. So, tell me when I know you studied law, and I, we'll go back to your sort of history a little bit in a, in a moment. But I, tell me the the thesis behind Big Small Talk. So. Yeah, what, what's your thesis? I guess it kind of comes back to what I felt Cheek was lacking in the space, right? I think it's really good to have podcasting as a medium when a lot of media currently is existing purely through social media. It's how to get people back off that immediate short form algorithmic function and out to like a longer form, get into the nitty gritty of something and listen to people discuss it in an opinion based way that's transparent. I'm not claiming to be objective in what I say. I'm claiming to challenge the mainstream and to offer my perspective, but being transparent about where that's coming from. And I think not enough young people feel invited into political conversations. So I wanted to meet that with pop culture. And so my co-host offers the pop culture sort of like social commentary side. And I'm kind of leading through that legal and political side to bring something together that Gen Z can engage with and not feel stupid or silly for not quite understanding because it's meant to be confusing. And that's how we break it down is saying, no, no, you should be invited to the table. You should feel like you have something to say in this space. And I'm going to explain it in a way that other media refuses to. So is it, is it, is it a, a talent-based show though? Do you, is it you talking about topics and or is it you interviewing other people about topics? It's me talking about topics and my co-host talking about topics. It's, it's together. It's yeah. a chat. It's and a conversation. Bouncing off each other on the biggest six stories of the week. Right, but as your co-host, um, equally aligned to you in uh, philosophically? I don't think always. I think often as well because she's coming more from the pop culture side that we offer two very different sides of like a cultural gen Z coin. Pop culture is think about things like celebrities. Yep. It's really about celebrities and social issues intertwine with that. Like it could be about the Taylor Swift tour. It could be about Beyonce's new album. It could be about the new Netflix documentary covering Nickelodeon and the child abuse scandals. It doesn't really sit alongside. I think people think it's frivolous but it actually can be very heavy material as well. But it's offering really like the celebrity versus the kind of political and legal is what I bring to the table essentially. But, but is that then, so uh, uh, is the format then, um, she brings a topic, pop culture topic to the, to the table and then you challenge it from a legal, political policy point of view or is it you're contributing the idea and she's in uh, presenting another side of the story? I guess it's we each present a story, three each week each. Right. And the other person commentates and kind of challenges one person's opinion. So I'm there not to offer a legal commentary on what she's saying, but to kind of question the line of thinking and to create conversation about the debate that might surround the given issue. So, is it, But is the idea, though, to uh, draw in your cohort of audience, your cohort being your age group or Gen Z, as you described it, and that, I guess you fit into that category. I do. I'm Gen Z, but my audience is women older than me. My audience is 37-year-old women primarily, which is really interesting. But are, you, but are you getting a Gen Z? Not as much. Honestly, I have more men over 60 than women under 20. No. Yes. And what? they're the ones that are paying subscribers too. Wow. Yeah. That's bad. 
it's it it's actually exceptional. It's what I need because they're the people with the money who are going to go and talk about it. And Gen Z often isn't politically activated until they're over 21, 22 minimum. So it's hard to get a 16 year old or an 18 year old to give a shit about any of this, right? It's a pipeline. So I'm actually impressed that I can reach people and talk equally with people so far my senior, but it also means I need to get into that audience that need to be activated and get passionate about things. So does, do you think it's the, re the reason why people, let's say men over 60, is the reason they're listening to us so they can um, find out what people in your cohort cohort are, argue, are arguing or thinking or basing their um, debate on? Just, so in other words, it's a bit of a vicarious glimpse into your world. Totally. I think that it's actually the fact that my media company, Cheek, on Instagram, what I'm doing more than aiming my chat at women is aiming commentary at people who feel like the Murdoch media hasn't represented their views and isn't being challenged. So I think more so than having these older men try to reach me, they're saying there's this woman who sits so far outside my bubble, my echo chamber, and yet I resonate with what she's saying and the way she's challenging the big dogs. And I think that people are drawn to that. So I always find it interesting because um, you, you you said mainstream media. I mean, I presume what you mean by this Murdoch, mm -hmm. yeah, mainstream media. But does that can mainstream media with Murdoch being um, print and uh, not really any no TV, um, yep. no radio either? I don't think do they? they I, oh, I not. I think it's. I think there is some, but it's not the main. Okay, so what do you mean by mainstream media? Do you mean main influencer? I mean Rupert Murdoch and News Corp. I also mean a lot of what Nine represents because really you're looking at Seven West Media, Nine and then Murdoch as the three big players in Australia, right, right who have this monopoly. And my thing is even if there's other diverse forms of media, they just do not get anywhere near the numbers. Penetration. Of, exactly. And it's also like the quality media in this country has to be paid for. You know, you have to subscribe to get that longer form journalism that people would agree is the higher quality journalism that we're still getting that isn't sort of infiltrated by Murdoch and the key players that have that clear agenda, right? But do you think 9 and 7, they, they're sort of, they come from a different angle, I think, to Murdoch? Totally, but I also don't think that that angle is any less driven by a clear political agenda that isn't transparent. Yeah, so do you th therefore do you think it's the same, is it the same political agenda? I don't think it's as aggressive as Murdoch, but I don't think it's different. Does that? I think that I do not think that they have the sort of conviction and the aggression and the extremism of Murdoch, but I do think they operate in the same field, which is leaning right wing. Yeah, so leaning right wing, whereas Murdoch, Murdoch Media, and if we talk about Sky or News Corp papers, et cetera, online, it's very right yeah, it's and unapologetically. Totally. It's a spectrum and it's really just the extremes of that spectrum. Do you, do you think if you had Rupert sitting here right now, um, uh, well, Lachlan perhaps, um, <laughs> uh, he would say the same thing to you. In other words, he would say, you know what, what, what we're doing is we're playing into the, the right-wing media because we can own that. We do own it. We can own that. But it makes sense for us to own it because we have an audience and uh, they want to hear our point of view relative to the other side. Yeah. Or do you think that they are died in the wall, um, non-negotiable uh, and never relenting right-wing protagonists? I do not think that they believe the views that they perpetrate, that they perpetuate. I think So it's more market-driven? Yep. I think that they lean into the fact that people are taking their views and running to the extreme. I don't think they think Donald Donald Trump is a prospectively good leader. I don't think that, he, that they believe he's a smart man. I think that it benefits them to support him as a leader. I Economically. Think, yes. I think that it benefits them and their stations and the viewpoint they're trying to position to support Donald Trump, but I think that they believe he's an idiot. So, 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 so your thesis is that it's more a business model. Yeah. Their business model is to speak to this audience because they can own it, they do own it, um, and if they don't, if they move away from someone else will take it anyway. So they own this audience. The audience is profitable. And that is advertisers who want to spend money to that audience. Um, that audience is sticky and they know how to feed that audience. Yes. So it's a business model. Yeah, they have commodified yeah. fear and shame and stupidity. Yeah. So I was because okay, well you've sort of answered the question before I asked, but so I was going to ask you, what are the elements that you think they need to 
have in their kit bag in order to appeal to the, that audience? I don't think it's difficult because I think we're already so far down this like rabbit hole of an algorithm where people are just siloed into their different camps and every issue has been positioned as a yes or no, a win or loss. It's every binary. Every debate, yeah. It's polarising. So people are not capable of coming to the table and having conversation anymore about a diff, a, any given political issue. So whether it's immigration, abortion, the vaccine, all of these issues have like a win or loss mindset where it's not actually about values or belief systems or policy. It's literally about this view that's perpetuated, are you red or blue? Are you a winner or a loser? And there's no room for what is the context that brought you to your opinion? How can I talk to you about your opinion in a safe and healthy way? I think that what the Murdoch media does differently, and they might accuse me of just doing exactly what they do. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Are you doing the same? That's the obvious question, right, is like are you just doing that for the left? I think the left has nothing like it. I don't see the left actually being able to get together and sort of rise to compete with the right actually because there's so much infighting, which I disagree with. I think the difference with what I do is that I'm critical of the algorithm. I'm critical of the short form journalism that has led us down this path of not being able to talk to each other respectfully anymore. I think there's no room for healthy debate. There's no public intellectuals anymore. It's just who has the sound bite in five seconds that sounds aggressive that goes well on TikTok or well on Facebook. And so as much as I also do lean into that short form content, I always come back to the value space, which is I've just written a book that's really about how to have political conversations, trying to engage a younger audience with those more respectful, secure ideas of how do you consume news and how do you check your media literacy? Where do you fact check? How do you read three sources? Where do you get them from? And how do you talk to your parents and grandparents about it without leaving Christmas lunch, basically? It sounds very much like um, as someone who did the same as you, uh, it sounds like uh, year one law school legal research and writing. Yeah. That's, year that's one it, su- top subject. But that's the thing. It's actually, actually quite basic. First, first semester subject. Yeah. Legal research and writing. It's basic. Yeah. That's the thing. I'm not asking for the world. Yeah. So so we, we if we could just go there for a moment, uh, you have a degree in law, law, law degree. Yeah. So you studied law yep. where? where? At uh, University of Queensland. Y- um, okay. Mm-hmm. So you studied at uh, UQ and uh, you've got your law degree there and- when you what, why did you go and do a law degree? I mean, were you this person when you were I don't know seventeen at school and about to go to uh, uni? I wasn't left wing when I went to university. I was politically engaged. Right. I grew up in Orange, so for anyone who's not from New South Wales, it's about three and a half hours outside of Sydney, small town, about forty five thousand people. Beautiful place, huh? Beautiful place. I yeah. mean, not when you grow up there, but beautiful place when you want to visit. It is today. Yeah, I went to a Catholic, quite conservative school. Um, my parents are very working class people. I didn't have the money to go to university sort of thing and I got a scholarship to go to UQ. And when I got there, I met just the best people ever who really introduced me to having these conversations. My parents I have always disagreed with but have always been open to questions and they are people that have voted right wing until the last federal election and they're the kind of people where we would have our disagreements and they would always try to answer my questions, but they always just wanted me to pursue whatever I was passionate about. There was never pressure. And I found that since I was 10, I wanted to be prime minister. So I was always politically engaged. Like I went to Canberra and I was not fascinated by parliament. I was fascinated by the electoral commission. And that sounds extremely boring and hilarious. Like my parents were like, what's wrong with this kid, right? And I thought about it, I was asked about it last week, and the thing that it came down to for me is I don't really care about politicians because I think that they're about as useful as a PNC committee a lot of the time. Like they're just screaming at each other about shit because of their power position, right? I think I was passionate about something like the Electoral Commission because I was passionate about what voting meant. It meant that we all had an equal power and an equal voice to determine who's in charge. And from there it was like I wanted to understand what people on the news talked about because that mattered to me. And so as much as I wasn't like politically active in terms of being left wing or in spaces like this and talking the way I do now, I'm fascinated by how we talk to each other and how we educate each other and ourselves on these topics. I did law, honestly, because I got really good marks at school and I thought what's the impressive thing to do? That is the honest truth. And I wish I hadn't. But I didn't think I wanted to do anything else. You wish I had done well or you wish I had done law? Law. Of what course would you have done? I. But what, what? 
Because you don't think, I think it may well have equipped you. Totally, it did. To have this ability to um, uh, have a critical thinking process and also understand the importance of making sure that you can say something persuasively, yep. but more importantly, authoritatively. Totally. And that's 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 the whole basis of being a lawyer. Absolutely. But when you enter law school, you're not thinking I'm entering here for that. You think I'm entering here to become a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as I started, I loved the ethics debates. I loved all of this, this persuasion stuff. Couldn't give a shit about the actual substance of tort law, property law. No. Like, boring, right? Oh, the social, the social uh, uh, fictions. They're, yeah. They're, they're all fictional. Totally. Everything's, <laughs> the whole thing's a fiction. I get it. It's all oh, made I'm up. serious. It's I say, rules. People look at me, they're just parliamentary. Parliament makes fictions, creates stories and out of that codifies it and next thing you know you're in trouble if you don't abide. And we change it every few years yeah, yeah, totally. to match so, that. Totally. I think that I did it and I kept doing it because I was, I'm was i just not a quitter in terms of like I didn't like doing the degree but I thought I'm learning a lot about how to critique this system and that will always equip me exactly. I always thought this is compelling stuff and I have this skill set and how to look at a system and critique it, how to look at these archaic institutions and go that's wrong, that's wrong and that's wrong and I know how to talk about it. What I hated about it was the culture of stuffy, elitist sort of people that wanted to climb a corporate ladder and be decision makers yeah, without that's life experience. Life, mate. I know. Yeah, but that's I, lecturers. Totally. But I resented it. Yeah, yeah. I was like, is this really what? Now? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I resent it. Well, but I, I, I still have an academic role at the University of New South Wales. Oh, so sorry. But, 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 <laughs> but I mean, because I, but I also, re, but I also recognise the uh, the fiction that gets created there. Like it, it's just one big fiction. It's all bullshit. It is. Um, but, and it's all it's supposed to represent social norms. But what the fuck is a social norm? I don't know. How can I work out? Sometimes I think to myself about criminals, and I think. Dude, I don't really have that big a problem with you because uh, it depends what the crime is. But I don't have the big, <laughs> big, I don't have the bigger problem with you because um, someone's just created a law which put you in jail. Um, you know, and there's plenty of great examples. Assange is a great example. We'll talk about him a bit a bit later because it is a bit topical at the moment. But someone's created laws around what they think is right and wrong. Yeah. And uh, who says whether they're right and wrong? They're politicians. They're, they're, they're the people we elect. In fact, a lot of times they're not the people we elect. They're the people sitting behind the people that we elect. Yes. Who are there forever. Yes. No matter who's elected. Totally. And uh, as a lot of times it's their idea what should and shouldn't be the case. Yeah. And what should and shouldn't be the law. And as a result of that, if you if you fall foul of that, in other words, you don't toe the line, you could end up in jail. Absolutely. There are good people who disobey bad laws, right? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, it's like... The, the reason I did the law degree was because I feel like I'm in a position now to explain to people that and how to change it. There's no use me sitting here and yelling and screaming into the void about not liking something if I'm not trying to change it. Mm. So I think that's really the push here is my passion is not necessarily being a politician yet. It's about saying to people, this entire system has hoodwinked you because you feel too silly or not informed to talk about it. And what I want to do is take the stuffy, complicated language, which is just a bunch of people in suits saying a bunch of nine letters in a row that don't really mean anything put together. Well, they make you feel like you're stupid exactly. on purpose. And that's my job I see it as. Like genuinely to say, stop, this headline actually means this or this is missing and this is missing and this is inappropriate and this is why. But this system cuts across everything, by the way. It's not just laws. No. I mean, like, I, I, I mean, I can talk about boring stuff like economics, but even things like gross domestic product, uh, what the Reserve Bank does, you know, that's just a, an organisation there to change our behaviour. Yep. Because they don't like our behaviour. It's like going to school and someone um, putting me in, in detention by increasing the interest rates to stop me spending money. Yes. But by the way, the money came from the government in the first place. Yes. <laughs> so it's 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 actually the problem's up here somewhere. It's not me. Yeah. And like, and we've had a lot of great economists in the world, like Milton Friedman, have always said, consumers don't create inflation, and everyone in Australia is being blamed for creating inflation. And by the way, around the world, you all spend too much money. You all went crazy. Wait a minute, as Milton Friedman would have said in 1996, he said, governments create inflation by putting money into the system. They put money into the system because they want you to spend the money. Yes, that's what they did to us. But now, do so. I, I guess what you're sort of saying, but, but I understand what you're saying, but this system. Not only exists in the law, it's not any part of the politics, but it's just part of the whole, everything we do. Kids' playgrounds, uh, you know, where you can put them, what sort of turf you've got to have under them and uh, what type of plastic that you can use. I mean, like, there's rules now around across everything. It drives me mental, yep. okay, and I don't even know how to escape it. I mean, for me, it's it's actually a, 
a, a, like a, a mental intellectual distraction for me. Yeah, same. It, it can sense me crazy, okay? But you're disrupting the mainstream media by saying that. Well, I do this for that reason. Yeah. Because uh, I want to bring, whether or not you and I agree on the pol- policies, yeah. it's irrelevant for me. No, same. I, I, I just want to hear what you've got to say and I want to talk to you about why you are doing this. Is it about change? Yes. For you? Yes, totally. So your outcome is you want people to listen to your show, perhaps over time change the way they approach the discussion. Yeah. But also, again, I don't want people to agree with me. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. People think I want – people who follow me and do agree with me want to just adopt my view and I think that's a failure too. Yeah, you're not trying to get them to agree with you. No. You want them to change the way they think, yeah. not change the way they think not change the view they have, but change the way they think about it. Exactly. And discuss it. Yes. And when they're reading, again, at baseline, don't feel stupid if you don't get it. It's on purpose. Come back, use what I'm saying as a springboard, and then go out and approach everything differently. Exactly that. It's about change over time and introducing people to the idea that it's purposeful, this confusion. It's an agenda. It's not a mistake. And I think that that's really how you create change, by making people feel, hey, person to person, we're not it's silly. We're not idiots. Sit down, read this, go and read it two other places and then come back to me what are five facts that you found from that. Like the basics of media literacy in this country are so low. Yeah, but well, that, that's sort of interesting because whether it's left or right, I often think to myself, and you might know the answer to this because I don't, is there a group of people who are sitting there either on the left or the right, manipulating the program in order to achieve the outcome? Or is it just the system's gone crazy and it's just building all these stupid fucking things up that uh, really confound me? Yeah, I think it's kind of both because I think it's there are groups of people that are making things, whether it be a particular masthead, a particular show, a particular radio program, a particular podcast – that are built with the outcome in mind. But also that's not because people get into a room and decide to be evil. That's because they all bring bias to it, right? Like for me, it's about saying, I'm not objective. I have all these opinions and belief systems that come from a very like niche and my personal experience of my upbringing, my childhood, my university experience. That's why I'm here today talking in the way I am, all of those millions of experiences. But I'm more honest about it. I think I'm saying the reason I think this is this, this, and this. Tell me why you disagree. I don't think Rupert Murdoch has ever done that. That's the difference is how to be transparent about the fact that we're all prejudiced. But do you think that it is the difference then just technique though? Technique in the his terms of- His techniques versus your technique. So he, he, he just talks to his audience. He just, and of course his audience is massive. So he just probably takes a view. I don't know if this is a case I've never interviewed him, but <laughs> I have met him though. But like uh, maybe Lachlan, you know, we, I might have the conversation with Lachlan one day, but is it just easier just to continually feed everybody what the algorithm says they want? Because a lot of this is uh, pretty removed from thought processes. Yeah. It's, as you said, algorithmic. Yeah. And it's about, especially today, yep. news.com.au, whatever it is. Um, do you think the difference between him and you is he's got a far bigger audience, he doesn't have the time to sit down and uh, explain things and make the debate look uh, reasonable or equal and uh, and just feeds them what they want because it's a business model and I think, it just works. I think he has the time he chooses not to. I think that if I decided tomorrow that I wanted to be just the opposite of Rupert Murdoch, I wouldn't get to Rupert Murdoch's status but I would get a lot further a lot quicker because I could just make content that feeds directly to that algorithm. And I think that I choose not to by doing different kinds of content that challenge our ways of thinking, not just competing with him in the opposite. So I don't think it's a difference of technique. I think it's a difference in values because I think his values are money. I think his values are however that money comes to his pocket and he retains political control and power. I think mine, my bank account's a lot different to his. And I think that that's because I actually more care about people and how they approach their own critical thinking. And yes, there are times when I play into the exact Rupert Murdoch style of thinking, but for the left, but it's also about fighting that and being honest about it and saying, yeah, I have fucked up. I know it, but I'm talking about it. And I don't think people like Rupert Murdoch do that. No. Well, it, and do you think that's a generation or oh, his couple of generations <laughs> uh, uh, beyond you, but do you think that's a generational thing? Because your generation has been brought up 
and it's not only generational, um, also um, education point of view. Mm-hmm. You're totally differently educated to him. You went through law school in a when law school when you're going through law school when I went through, compared to when I went through law school. Law school is completely different today. Mm-hmm. Much more critical think, thinking, um, more left to to the left than it ever has been in the past. You know, like you know when I was in, at university in 1975. Um, um, it was uh, all about investment banking and uh, make as much money as you could as a lawyer. Really, it was. It was not about proper critical thinking. It was. A, you know, I went to the University of New South Wales. It was a more. Uh, yeah, it's more about. It was well, I was doing commerce law, so it's a different sort of vibe mm. to, to today. I know today it's much broader. Yep. And and more more equal, more equivalent, and uh, people's opinions from both sides. In fact, probably more to the left uh, are considered that today than they were ever in the past. In fact, if you, I, I remember doing cases like if you had a socialist view, you were actually in a, you know, you were looked at a bit weird. Um, yeah. You know, like you might be representing communism. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, uh, we, we we there was a lot of const- in constitutional laws, a lot of stuff around the in, the infiltration of the communists into Australia. Now, let's say Murdoch went through that period. In fact, he's even beyond that from my point of view. But he's also generationally totally different. Um, you know, generation, genera- generationally, look, that's my view. That's my view. That I don't give a stuff about anyone else's view. Yeah. Do you think it's as much about that for him, or do you think it's and you know, and because he does control his, I think he controls his organization. You know, it's like. You know, it's his policy sort of thing or his family's policy. Do you think it's about that and therefore there's an excuse? I think that's undermining his intellect. Like I think that I think people know they can change their view. I think the smartest people, maybe maybe we're not, I think the smartest people are the people most capable of changing their mind when presented with new information. I think that people believe that to be steadfast and like committed to a certain viewpoint is like the greatest sign of you're a smart person basically. But I think that that's an arrogant person because I think that you need to be able to change with the times. And so I think that Rupert Murdoch, I think he knows what he's doing. I think it's a purposeful choice and I think it's strategic. I don't think, I think many people of that time do hold those views, but I don't think Rupert Murdoch does. So what, what would be the strategy then? Power? Yeah. I think that he's in control of that right-wing extremist sort of narrative and he can funnel out things and have people pay him to do so. I think that perpetuating a sort of feeding into a society that hates each other and stokes those culture wars and, and increases those divides benefits him greatly. He doesn't want that to stop anytime soon. He wants it to get worse because misinformation and disinformation benefit him. So that's interesting you, you talk about the uh, divide because, I mean, that's one of the things that sort of it's new to me um, in that it's become quite blunt, the, the, the divide now today. And it sort of aggravates me a little bit that, that we seem to be living in this massive divide because um, you're nearly forced to take a view, yep. like aside. Yeah. And uh, before maybe we were a bit lazy in our thinking and we didn't have to – we didn't have to take sides. It wasn't a thing. But now we're sort of being forced to take a side. And in terms of critical thinking and also debate – Sometimes people don't engage because they don't want to get shouted at. Yeah. Either by the left or the right, mm. because whatever position you take, the opposite applies. And the next thing you know, given the way the media works, mediums work today, um, you could find yourself getting cancelled, or you could find yourself in all sorts of shit from either from either point of view. Do you think that's a big reason why people? don't engage and don't debate and don't think about things critically. It's yeah. just too fucking hard. Totally. And, it, again, it's like you've got one of two options. So I think that makes people just pick a side and just conform to it depending on their social group or their and family. And hang out with that group yeah. and then therefore there's no drama, yeah, and no stress. Exactly. Or they just, yeah, remain quiet, disengaged because – and it's like things like the referendum are a really great example of that where – The recent one. Yes. And it, it sort of – pushed by people like Peter Dutton, the opposition leader, who said, like, if you don't know, vote no, which is inviting people to go, I'm really scared of this, so I'm just going to vote one way still, pick a side, as a point of ease to not having to step up and learn something or engage. And I get it because there's a lot of shouting and a lot of yelling and a lot of lies out there. But I think that the disengagement and withdrawal has always been pushed by people by conservatives because it's like don't do anything that's the answer to being confused and I don't think that's the way to be I don't think Gen Z thinks that's the way to be either 
And I also had someone a couple of weeks ago message me um, and say, just a follower, and say, can you tell me again why we hate Peter Dutton? <laughs> and I, exactly, right? And I thought, oh my, and you know what? Obviously I'm not a supporter of Peter Dutton. Like quite clearly from my political stances, I'm not. But I think I did some great work for Peter Dutton that day PR-wise because I said I could have easily gone back and said 10 reasons why I dislike Peter Dutton. That would have been the inflammatory easy like I'm just going to enforce my view on you way to do things. And instead I said if you can't tell me why you don't like Peter Dutton, you are fine with Peter Dutton. You are neutral. Until you can articulate and go and find reasoning, I'm sorry to tell you that you don't hate him. And it's so important that you don't just agree with people because that's what's popular on Instagram. It's what you're seeing, it's what you're sharing. But can you tell me? Because if you can't, you need to seriously reevaluate why you would use especially the word hate, which is such an extreme, intense emotion, to describe someone that you don't know. And I don't like Peter Dutton and I can rattle off 10 things, but that's not the way that we should be going about political conversations and topics because simply that's someone who isn't educated and isn't informed on the issues and needs to go out and find information. Because it's interesting, you know, it's funny how you should say this because the other day I ran into Dave Sharma and uh, sent it to Dave Sharma. Yes. And uh, and uh, he's, as you know, he's pro-Israel. Uh, he was the ambassador uh, the ambassador or the consul general or something like that in Israel many years ago. He's not, he's not Jewish. Um, in fact, he's Indian. Um, everyone thinks he's Jewish, but he's not. Um, and Dave... And I, and I bumped into him in a building where there's a lot of politicians. It was in Sydney where they come when they come to Sydney when Parliament's not Sydney. And I said, Dave, um, how are you going, mate, down there? Uh, really, I mean, the, the divide down there in relation to pro-Israel versus pro-Palestine is quite emphatic. Um, it's nearly like you've got to take a side. I said, when you are debating these individuals, either in Parliament or on media, when you walk past them, how do you feel? Like, what do you say? G'day, how are you going? Mm. You know, Penny? Uh, uh, yeah. You know, like, whatever. And he said, it's, inter it's interesting, Mark. He said, uh, we're all very cordial to each towards each other. And we manage to maintain our position or our dignity person to person. What do you think about that? Uh, I mean, that's... I mean, I know the word hatred's not a good word. Like, it's a bad word. Is this sort of what you're saying? Like, let's just have – it's fair that Penny Wong can have her view and it's fair that um, Dave Sharma can have his view. Um, but equally and, – and they can express it and prosecute it however, however best they can. But at the end of the day, it's just a debate. Is it beyond just a debate for you? Yes, but it depends on the issue. Like, I just think it's – okay, for example, in this particular example, I think it's difficult because we're talking about a workplace, right? We're talking about people just showing each other basic human respect in a workplace, which I think is necessary because in order to have longevity in those sorts of roles which are all about human issues every single day, you need to show respect to one another outside the chamber. I get that. Or and, – and, yeah, okay, as, yeah. As I, in like corridors. Yes, yeah. exactly. I mean if you can debate all you want inside. But I think the reality is it's not a debate, is it? We're talking about the murder, the killing of tens of thousands of people. And so what's interesting is that it's like I think the question always comes up how to – how to engage with people who have a different point of view to you. And I think it's because, again, there's a spectrum. If I go to my family lunch – I have a particular family member who fundamentally doesn't believe that I should have equal rights to him as a woman. I find that hard to sit at a table with because that is deeply disturbing and makes me not feel like a human. As a fundamental. Right. And it's like how, how long can I debate something before it's like I actually just there's no use? Because what I say to people is like do not relentlessly put yourself in a position of harm with someone that just is a racist or is just a misogynist, right, that's fundamentally hates a group of people and is overt about that because you're never going to have a respectful conversation with that person where you walk away feeling like you both had thoughts to give and things to take away because it's not really about winning for me. I'm not trying to win you over. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not trying to convince you I'm right. I want us to talk and go, huh, that made me think about three things and now I'll go away and approach something differently. Some people you can do that with but many you can't. And so like in a person-to-person -person context, it's not political, like not politicians, I mean, I think it's about like 
I'm not going to debate someone that doesn't see me as a person and I'm not going to debate someone that's really overtly offensive. I'm going to talk to someone that is open to hearing what I have to say and respects me as a person and we can walk away saying, oh, that was kind of convincing. I liked that point. And I think that's the key for me is like I, I don't think that politicians are the greatest example because they're the people that we lobby to make change on the views that we reflect in our society. So I want them to be doing more than they're doing. I want them to respect each other as people, but I'm more harsh on that level of debate where I think, no, 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 you're the change maker here and you're the person I should be talking to to have that change made, so I'm harsher. So as you say, change occurs and it sometimes occurs at a glacial speed, unfortunately. And a good example of that is I heard this morning, and uh, I don't know when this show's going to go to air, but like, it doesn't matter. I heard this morning that um, Biden's now considering um, uh, giving Julian Assange mm-hmm. a pardon, which that's new narrative. Yes. Um, obviously Biden sort of represents the left, I guess, in the US. The election's coming up. Someone like you. Mm. How would you approach that? Because would you start to say to yourself, well, hang on a minute, what, are you changing because it's a it's proper to uh, Biden? Are you changing because it's proper to change? Or are you changing because you want to make sure you satisfy those people who are actually gonna, maybe going to vote for you in the next election? Is this real or not real? That's what's exhausting about this is that oh they God. withhold change until an election year, and we'll see it with the Albanese government too. I, again, they're a quote unquote, in quotations, progressive government. I think they're moderate at best. And I think that in this election year that's coming up, we will see a lot of commitments when we've seen a lot of inaction for the last year or two. Like I've seen them do very little in terms of policy. Well, budget's coming up, you're going to see a heap. Exactly. But that's what I mean. They wait till they're primed and they do something for a headline and that's it. And then we wait another year for anything meaningful to happen again because they don't want to rock the boat. Biden's the same. He's copying a lot about over Israel and his inaction around, you know, he's basically weaponizing what's occurring in Palestine. And so for his own for his own benefit. Absolutely. Well, and in fact for some states where he does where it's critical for him to win. Yes. It's not even across America. No. It's for specific states where he must win. Which is pork barreling, really. Well, if we yeah. want to come up with a term, that's that's yeah. that's one that comes to mind. Yeah. And so it's, it's exhausting because you're looking at these people knowing they could do anything at any time and they wait and they do it when it's appropriate for a headline and for a vote. And it is, it's, it really comes back to that view of like politicians are just people and they're just trying to retain power. And it's like a firm belief I have, like people who really want to be a cop or a politician are probably the people that shouldn't have the job. You know, if you desperately want it, you're probably not the appropriate person. And I think that it's very rare to come across someone who is there for the genuine reasons. And that concerns me. But how do you change that culture? How do you get people in that care and don't succumb to that that ecosystem? What do you think about this iron situation? Um, I think that he should be pardoned. I don't – or I think the like what I read a few weeks ago before Biden's come out and suggested this is like that the UK wanted confirmation that he wouldn't face the death penalty. Um, I, I think that he's been held for long enough. I think that so he's done his time. Yep, so to speak. Yeah, but does that mean? Do, do, can I extrapolate? Yeah, from please that? do. Can I extrapolate from that? Does that mean that you think he committed a crime? No, I. Or a transgression. Here's honestly, here's what I think. I do not think Julian Assange committed a crime. The reason I generally don't talk too much about Assange is that there were allegations of sexual assault made against him. Oh no, well, this, I, I know, but, but I can't put it aside because I think all of those things sit together. But that's a different. Well, but I overtly don't think Fine. he committed a crime. I think he released confidential information for the for public interest that was for good. Okay, can, can I just talk about the, because it, from America's point of view, mm-hmm. they just take a hardline view. Yep. You released uh, uh, government secrets or defence secrets, whatever the it was, defence secrets. Yeah. Um, therefore, you got to pay the pay 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 the piper. Okay. Yeah. And uh, may well be that he's already paid because he's already been in uh, inca- effectively incarcerated for all this time. Yeah. Um, but just put that aside for a second because um, f- for me it may be that he should have released that, that information. He shouldn't have? He should have. Yes, I agree. Because people actually should know about this sort of shit. I agree. And That's now, my position. And uh, But there's a, an old rule in the US that talks – that's been around forever. No matter what, you do not uh, commit this transgression by giving the enemy, not, not you or me, but no, the enemy. No. Yep. 
um, whoever that might be, um, access to stuff that's been you know, that we keep in secret that might actually have a deleterious effect on us in relation to our ability to defend our shores, for example. Yeah. Um, but one would say, but now we, we're in a different world now. Now we're saying, no, but some of the stuff he should have released. Now, but therefore, some of the stuff maybe he should have, some of the stuff he should have. It's Semantics, getting, isn't it's, it? It's, but it's, it's getting very, it's sort of like, but get tricky. And uh, how do you on your show, I don't know if you've done a podcast on this, but uh, how do you on your show approach, it's complicated. Yeah, it is. You know, how do you approach it? Well, I think it's about really laying out the timeline of what occurred and you can't do that in a 10-minute news segment no. but doing it to the best of your ability yeah. and then really discussing, I think from my perspective it's like what is the purpose of the law here, right? Exactly what you've just said, like that the US is saying you've given information to the enemy, right? But then I kind of look and think, okay, let's look at this, what's occurred? What was his intent and what was the impact, right? So his intent was really to show war crimes that had been committed and his impact was that he did. Like that was that was unleashed, this information about what the US had done. Both the intention and the impact, I support the release of those things. I support that decision making. And I think in the same position, I would have done exactly what he did. I don't know if I'm brave enough, but I would hope that I could. I don't think, and earlier when I said like, I think he's done his time, I mean, surely Biden just lets him go. Like he has been caged basically for so, that's so long. That's a practical outcome. Totally. But I think in terms of my personal view, the approach I have is laying out the facts, laying out the law, and then having a conversation about what is freedom of speech and what is kind of in terms of US military secrets, like what is the impact here, the intention, and what does the enemy get from this? Ultimately, I think when the US says it's about the enemy, they're lying. I think it's about the fact that they've been exposed. And I think anything else is a lie that they would say in defence of that. So, and we're seeing it in Australia right now. We're saying, seeing a, milit a former military lawyer, David McBride, who's being prosecuted over leaking in similar information about Australian war crimes in Afghanistan. And I've backed his case when we covered it on our podcast as well because this is important. And these things are just buried under the guise of like government protection but that's not what it is at all. It's to conceal crime. The government has the ability to determine what is considered crime at an individual level, but when it's turned on them, they're unwilling to accept it. Instead, they prosecute the person calling it out. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. So if I, but in the beginning, I was in the earlier period of when you and I were talking about when I sort of said uh, the law is a bit of an ass anyway, like uh, it's all fictional. Um, so on one hand, if uh, he committed a crime, it's uh, Assange, for example, um, according to US legal position, um, it's a fiction that they created. But equally, um, if he accuses someone of a war crime, can a war crime be equally fictional? See, I don't agree with you that the law is fictional. But I think it's really about public rules, right, around what is fair okay. and what is moral behaviour. Or is it more about what is better f to sort of control society, societal control, so we don't have – in an, an, a non-anarchist way, we don't need anarchy. I was about to say, you're an anarchist. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm not. But, but I accept – because I accept controls in order – just like religion helps control yep. some things too. I accept controls to the point of view of stopping anarchy. In other words, if there's no rules, I can go and chop someone's head off. Yep which is sort of what some of the terrorists tend to do in, from, from time to time. Correct. There's no rules. Yeah. Um, so, but like that's the the worst position. But then when you start layering that and layering and keep layering, keep layering all of a sudden there's there's rules about everything, you know, what you can wear, what you can say, how quickly you got to speak. You know, I'm against that shit. Like I, I know you've got to stop anarchy down here. I get that. Mm. The question is how far do you go? Yeah. So Assange is an example. Um you he's 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 calling out war crimes but uh are, are you saying the war crimes would you say the war crimes are actually at an amoral level and therefore are close to anarchy a form of anarchy therefore should be called out compared to his crime which is something that's just developed for, to, that, oh, a matter of convenience for the government of the united states is that what you are saying I think I kind of agree with a bit of both, actually, what you're saying. I do not think the US should be able to commit war crimes in Afghanistan and not have that held to account. But I also think 
in regards to the second option, it is a law that's been created by the US to protect themselves. Both can exist there. So I obviously, I would sit a bit differently to you. I believe in most laws. I understand their purpose and I believe that they help society function better. I also believe that parts of the system need to be completely reformed um, because I don't think, I actually don't really believe in a prison system. I do not think that 90% of people that are currently in prison should be in prison. What about the 10% that are? I think the 10% that are are people that have committed serial murder, yeah, so serial society's, pedophilia. Yeah, society's safer. I believe certain crimes, I believe most crimes should still exist in the rule of the law. I think the way that they should be punished should be different. So I believe that most of the behaviours that form under the Crimes Act, say, are real, existing and should have accountability as a, as a form, whatever that system looks like. I don't believe that most of those crimes should result in people being caged. I think that most people who commit crime have existed in socioeconomic standards and situations and been unsupported by the government that have led to them committing crimes. And I or wish caused by the government sometimes. Exactly. And I wish that those barriers were removed so that people were more supported in society to not have to commit crime. And I also think that the way that we go about prosecuting is not right. The way that we in like force victims to re-traumatise themselves through that process. I also think that if we asked most victims of different crimes what they wanted out of the outcome, it probably wouldn't be, and this is obviously a generalisation because there's so many crimes, but, if, you know, take a lot of, there's a lot of the, the Me Too movement, right? A lot of it is around this, like, this culture war where you've got people saying, like, presumption of innocence, fair process, all of these things, but no one's arguing against the presumption of innocence. What we're arguing against is a court system which forces victims to re-traumatise themselves and never really gets a just outcome for anyone because ultimately what they want is for the crime to never have occurred or not to occur again. And you don't really get that through 1% of people being jailed or through the jail system anyway. It's not rehabilitative, right? So I disagree with the way that our prison system and legal system punishes perpetrators instead of helping them from childhood or helping rehabilitate them after the crime's been committed. That's my kind of belief system as opposed to yours, which is really the, like a lot of law is fiction. Yeah. Well, I, I have friends who have gone to jail because when they were young young men, like you know, teenagers back in – we're going back a long time ago – we had uh, effectively had reform schools and just dreadful places where they were sent because they might have stole something when yep. they were 12 or 13 and they were committed to these places and they were either sexually abused or physically abused, yep. bashed. And uh, they come out, they become institutionalised and they come out of that system thinking most of them are, you know, would have had were dyslexic or things that were never recognised back in those days, poor learning abilities, yeah. not stupid but just unabil inability to learn the normal way that you and I learn at school. They weren't supported. Yeah, and uh, and they become institutionalised and they believe that that's the person they are. And, you know, because I'm a big believer and there's a very famous book called Neurocomic which um, where it's a, a, a neurologist or a neuroscientist works together with an illustrator where they – they, in a comic form, they show us how we build a story about ourselves and we then have that story confirmed and affirmed and eventually that's how our brain works. And to rehabilitate someone, you have to actually put a stop on that thought, thought pattern and actually change how your brain actually thinks about itself Yeah. or the story about who I am. Exactly. My mates, a lot of my mates, they came out of, out of these places thinking, well, I'm a criminal. Yeah. That's who accepts me and I can't go and do a law degree like you or I because yeah. uh, I'm not smart enough because I'm being told by society I'm, I'm a bit dumb when I'm not. Yeah. Um, and, but I'm pretty actually bright <laughs> and I can perpetrate a really good crime. <laughs> and uh, You know what I mean? And yeah. uh, they, they just keep doing it. Yes. And eventually – but but how do you how do you reform that? Like um, how, how the fuck do you fix that up? Yeah. Well, the system's – Massive. Yeah, totally. And it's hard because it's not an overnight fix, right? No. But you look at it and, like, especially right now there's a huge issue with youth offending in this country, right? And a lot of the media perpetrates, like, youth delinquents, you know, like put them away. But you're putting children as young as 10 who can be strip searched, arrested, charged, put in youth facilities uh, all over the country um, behind bars and isolating them from the ability to be rehabilitated, right? Or worse, you're putting them with other criminals. That's the thing. 
it's like these kids are stopped from their education. They're already clearly in a socioeconomic environment, a lot of them, that isn't supported. Um, we're in cost of living crisis. Like the trickle down effect on families, like a lot of kids are really responding to lack of attention or support and struggling at school, right? And you'll find that when we look at the data on kids that die after being in youth facilities or, you know, or take kids their own, that, Or take their own Yes, life. or yep. who just completely reoffend over and over again, you're looking at a system that hasn't supported them and will continue to fail them into adulthood. How do you change that? Well, I've got mates who have been through exactly that process and they've never changed. It's not until they get to a, a, a point in their life physically where they can't actually do it anymore. Yeah. They, and they can't take the stress. Like uh, they just – it becomes a point where they become broken. Yeah. And uh, I just don't want to go back to jail again, so I'm never going to commit that crime again. Yeah. I can't, I can't do it. That, that, that conversation. That is ultimately where you end 60s, up. Eventually the system will break them down. Yes. And they, and they just give up. Yeah. But they fight against it, uh, you know, forever. But then a point just comes, that's it. I'm, and they sort of retire from crime because they no longer can take the fight. I, I, I have to ask you, you said uh, – you said earlier on about becoming prime minister. Mm. Come on. Yeah. Do you really mean it? Seriously? Yeah, totally. It's okay. so funny. It's so funny that you think that, like, come on. Why? No, no, no. I'll tell you why. Because I was once asked many years ago, and I won't go into the story because it's quite confidential, but um, from another person, I couldn't give a shit, but no, I don't want to reveal who it was. But um, I was asked, would I form another party, mm. political party? This is like 15 years ago maybe 10, 12, whatever, and uh, somewhere between left and right, mm -hmm. like between the two, two, two major parties. And tr and uh, uh, the person offered to fund it. It was a big deal. And I thought about it. I thought, oh, that'd be fun. Go change things. Oh, this shit I want to change. You know, I don't like this. I don't like that. Some of the things you and I discussed. But I thought, my God, I can't imagine myself going down to the mothership in Canberra <laughs> and living in Canberra for uh, whatever amount of time they're going to spend down there and being away from everybody and just just uh, that whole environment just I, just I think it's toxic. Yeah, it is. It's just a shit environment. Yeah. I'm sorry to say all well, the senators and politicians love it down there. I hate it. I think there's a lot of shit people involved, if I'm it's being a, honest. It, it was just a, but the whole thing is shit. Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> like it's not modern. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's old. It's like going back in time. It's and you walk in the. I mean, I've been there a number of times. You walk around there, you feel like you're in an old institution that controls you, that owns you, there and then. Why would you consider it? Because I believe I'd do it differently. You have to believe that because going you can change in, right? that as well. Yeah. When you say you can all dial in, or I mean, like, uh, uh, I I think that like if I disagree. If I don't think current politicians are there for the right reasons, I don't think they're real people. I think that they get media training and then they're just selling something to us basically over and over again every three years. How do I challenge that? How do I become a real person in this spectrum and say be the point of difference? And it's hard because like do I genuinely believe I could get in there and maintain who I am now and not be muzzled? I don't know. That's why the only reason I haven't done it yet is because I don't really agree with the two-party system. I would I would consider being an independent candidate, well, but how do you become prime minister? Well, you can't that? become an independent. Exactly. You can't become prime minister if you're an independent. Well, let's start a political party and then we'll Well, that's win. my point. Yeah. So, so then you've got to start a political party. And you've got to get funded. You've got to get funded. Yep. You've got to start a political party, but then you've got to find other like-minded people. Mm. A bit or like, not. Or a bit like the, but you've got to have your, your team. Yeah. You know, uh, Team Hannah. Yep. Like the like like the Teals. Yeah. You've got to have them mm -hmm. representing one in Wentworth, one blah blah blah, all around the joint. Um, it becomes a mission. It is. It's a major mission, and you get so bogged down in the mission that you forget about the principles or the real reason why you might be there. I don't know. How do I, you feel about that? I don't. Maybe I, you're young enough to do it. Like I, I, you know, for me, I, I maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm too hopeful about all of this. But I, I don't think that has to happen. I think you have to have the right people, which is the hardest part. I think trusting yeah. people with a mission like that is the harder part than sticking to your values. Correct. Getting the people. Yeah. That's, but how do you find those people? There are so many people. You're that, 150. There's 150 seats. Yeah. Or something like you that. You go slow. At first, yeah, you so build. You, it would take my lifetime to yeah, do what we're talking about. It will about. take a lifetime. Yeah. Great. But yeah. I believe I can do it. Yeah. So what what would it take to get you to do that? I considered we've got an election coming up next year. I've had some conversations about potentially running, had some advice about which party or going independent. The hardest part for me is I'm not a business mind. I don't know how to run a party and to get the funding and do all of those things. I'm not confident in that space. I'm not confident financially. And so that's the hardest part to me is getting the backing 
in the initial phase to then have the confidence to go out and do this. I'm also 25 and I think I have more power right now talking in the way I do as freely as I want to about any given issue. And I would rather build that out for potentially three more years before having a crack because I think I need to get some more experience under my belt before I have a go at the big league, the mothership as you describe. Yeah, okay, so if I put an idea into your head, if yeah. you don't mind, not that I'm trying to manipulate you, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I wonder whether or not someone like you and your a cohort of like-minded friends of yours established an online parliament mm-hmm. and everyone in Australia who chooses to can register in the current ward that they're in. Like let's say I'm in Wentworth or I'm in the CBD. Um, or let's say Wentworth 3 to make it easier. Um, I'm in Wentworth. So you create the ward of Wentworth online mm-hmm. and everybody who's in Wentworth can now register as a voter yep. in Wentworth. But then the election's coming up and the, the you know, the, the, um, administrator of the website just says, um, nominate. Anyone can nominate to be the person in Wentworth. You don't have to have any money. You just go online. You say, and you get up in your soapbox. It's like domain, the domain, mm-hmm. the old days getting in the domain. You get up there and you get online and you facilitate the, the, uh, the, the platform. And you stand in one of the seats too. You stand in the seat of orange or wherever you want, you choose, yep. to, whatever that seat is. And you choose to, to, to you, the place you want to sit. And if you get elected, then you you control and you say I'm now running the, the for one of a better name the moderates or the in between party <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because and then at every time you you allow and the reason why I would go and register on online is because you're going to say every single issue mark that comes up I'm not going to decide it as your senator or your house of reps person you all get a say and everybody can vote on nearly every issue mm. or any issue they choose to vote on yeah as opposed to electing so-and-so in my ward and then I never get a say again until the next election as to everything that an individual decides. Totally. I understand what you're saying. No, it's it's sort of like disrupting the whole election system. It is, but is every person informed enough on every issue to it's make... It's up to the person in the ward and it's up to you who the, administers the whole thing. So this better than going to parliament. It's better than, you're doing all this online. You're doing it from your home. Do you think people would do it? I would. But I don't know this. I've never done a survey, but I would. Survey one. <laughs> my worry is the people that would opt in to deciding on every single issue are the polls of people, the extremists on both sides when we lose a lot of the middle. But if you can, someone like you could, could, could I think, could influence, not influence people, persuasively and authoritatively explain the reason why you should be engaged. You could say to your parents and your relative who doesn't think you're the, <laughs> yeah. equal to him. Might not listen. <laughs> um, but, but you can explain to them why it's important for them to get up and put their point of view up there. Yeah. Otherwise they're, uh, they're intellectually weak. Get, get up and say what you think. It, and it doesn't have to be on every issue, but at least we, you, you, the politician, will be, or whoever gets voted in, will be getting the, the access to all the people they're supposed to be representing. Because that's the biggest pro- – for me the biggest problem in politics today is politicians are voted in on one day – and they represent you for the next three years on every issue that you never even get a chance to talk about. It's all in retrospect. So they are prospective. So they're prospectively voted in today for everything that's going to happen over the next three years. Yeah. Which that doesn't make sense to me because I don't even know what's going to come up. And you don't really know much about them. You just know what the party often. Correct. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know whether they're equipped to talk on uh, international security or, you know, what's going on in, uh, in uh, Israel and uh, Gaza at the moment. I don't know. I mean, I didn't know it was going to come up. Nor did they know it was going to come because it happened, and it was it happened, and they weren't privy to this sort of stuff. I mean, because I, I just think the system of politics is wrong. I don't mean the people are wrong. The system is wrong. I worry though that the the idea, which is a good idea, I will be I'm thinking. Just about, it out I'm there. thinking about it, but I think it's interesting because it puts a lot of trust in the general public who do not give a shit. Mostly, mostly, I'm, I'm speaking not sure. to a very. I'm not sure. do you we are a bad example. But you, okay, but you got your followers yeah. and I got my followers. So true. I mean, I'll, I'll, if you do it, I will definitely um, support and promote it to everyone who listens to my show. My first endorsement from an idea that's yours. So your IP, I'm executing, you're endorsing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You like, you like <laughs> yeah, where I'm going? I do. <laughs> that's cool. <called. laughs> 
<laughs> I am the Prime Minister. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> no. When you're talking about uh, the people behind the yeah, person, yeah, yeah, that's you it, right now. No, I, just, I know, I'm going red, I can feel it. But, um, but it's because it's funny, I actually put this idea to a guy many years ago and um, – because uh, after they asked me to do something, I thought, no, no, that's just dumb. It doesn't make sense. And over time, I kept thinking about it. And some, then I thought, no, I'm probably more effective behind the microphone like you are. Yes. But then I thought, no, that, that's, Mac, that's, a bit, that's a bit of a cop-out. Um, what environment would you do it? I probably would do it in that environment. Why? I don't want to – look, it's simple. I don't want to go to Canberra. That's it. That's it. You just don't like the place or the mothership? No, I don't, no, I don't, like, no I, I don't like the place. I don't like what goes on there. I don't like it the way it works. Everybody's doing deals, corridor deals, and everyone's trading. I don't like that part of it. And I don't like uh, – and I, I think it's infected. You're actually – your theory of change is not becoming part of the system and, and changing it. Change it's, the system. It's changing the system. Yeah, that's I, how you, I like that. That's how you change. You've yeah. got to change the system. You're about burn it down, try something else. Yeah, because you are saying to me uh, you want to become promised, but the, 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 the prospect is very, very it's, – it's, it's in the distance. Totally. And what I like about you is your, your youth and your energy and to some extent a little bit of naivety, which is very important it is. in terms of making change. Yes. What I'm saying to you, though, is I think if I could somehow be part of – um, promoting all of that and, and garnering all of that, which I don't have because I'm, you know, by definition older, <laughs> but by, by, by garnering – and I'm also older, I'm more defensive. Yeah. I've got more to lose and that's just a natural instinct. I've got more to lose. Yeah. My lifestyle, how I live and how I get to talk to people You're like you. You're conserving. Yeah, I, I yeah. fail him because that's what happens at the end of your time. Yes. You know, like I've got 646 weeks left if I've got 4,000 – if I've been given 4,000 weeks in my life, yeah. which, you know, statistically I have, I've only got 640-something left, okay? So yep. I'm going to think, hang on, I want to make every post a winner. Yeah. And if I want to make change, I want to make sure I'm going to make change. Yep. Or we'll talk about making change. I don't want to talk about making change. And I don't have – 2,500 weeks like you do. I've yeah. got uh, a lot less. So i, I got to make every – and I've got other things. Other things are prioritised in my life, you know, like grandkids and shit like that. So I, I guess uh, – yeah, I, I, anyway, I'm just having a conversation, Mac. Yeah. I know we've gone all over the joint. And uh, i just put it out to you, though, yeah. as an idea. Um, and I know your friends with Jono used to be one of the production guys here. Yes. I put that idea to Jono years ago. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jono is very politically aware as you know. Yes, he is. And uh, which no doubt what reason why you guys are friends. But very politically aware and uh, and uh, he, he sort of thought it was a good idea at the time because I, I quite like make changing systems. I mean, I'm, you know, I did the podcast because I thought Australia needed a podcast. I started this nine years ago, <laughs> you know, and uh, as a fun thing to do, but let's bring Australian content to the podcast world. Absolutely. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And, and and genuinely the point of like this for me is yes I'm naive and young but my job if I have two and a half thousand weeks is to convince people with 600 weeks to vote on behalf of someone with two and a half thousand weeks and yeah, to totally not, totally and to like get I on would board. vote for you a hundred percent like I would vote for your energy if nothing else and your I don't mean just energetic no thank but you I, but okay. I mean but I mean energy in terms of consideration of both sides of the of the discussion yeah that that's that takes energy. Thank you. It, it, it takes a lot of, like, intellectual energy, I mean. Fuck, I fucking know what it's it exhausting. Because it, no, it is exhausting because you keep bumping into things all the time. Yeah. And you bump into really powerful things. Yeah. Things with lots of momentum. Yeah. And, you you know, like, whoa, like, like that. That takes a lot of fucking energy. Someone like me, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Because I don't have that energy anymore, unfortunately. I just don't have it. I, I mean, I, I – But you, you do so much. But yeah, I know, but it's, it's – but what I do is, look, to be honest, it looks like a lot, but it's, it's, it's easy. Okay. It comes second nature. Yeah. I would do it. I just do it. I do it on my ear, if you know what I mean. I, I do. I, I, don't, I don't mean that. To, I'm not sort of ex exalting myself. I, I just, I've been doing it so long, it's easy for me. Yeah. Um, someone like you, it, I, I don't, I would not have the energy to do what you do. Yeah. What some, what, and I think there's so much potential there. Yeah. It's how you use it and how I go about it that can have longevity. That's my fear. Yeah. That's, yeah. And uh, anyway, if I can help you at any stage, if you've got an idea and you want to share it with me, um, I'm happy to help, you know, reach out any time you like. And I'd, I I think Australia needs to see not just one of you, though. We need to see 100 and 
out of the 150 seats, we need to see, you know, 75 at least of yeah. you. So uh, calling out to all people <laughs> who like what Hannah stands for. And it's not left or right. It's just the debate or the, the discussion, the intellectual energy to actually open up the, the discussion for both sides of the argument. I'm serious. Go and listen to her podcast and follow her. Thanks, Mark. That's that's one vote. That's one vote. That'll do. That's a that start. actually will do. That's where you start. Yeah, it is. It is. And my mum. You won me over. <laughs> Thank you. Good on you, Hannah. Thanks. Thank you very much. 